gentle listener, and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, the fortnightly podcast that brings you dark tales, both old and new, performed by voice artist Kristen Holland. This episode's bleak offering comes to us courtesy of our old friend, P.L. Macmillan. You may remember her previous story, That Which the Ocean Gives and Takes Away, which we featured in June last year in our 77th episode, entitled That Which the Ocean Gives and Takes Away, of course, Gentle Listener. Well, there'll be no seaside shenanigans this time around. This tale is something quite different. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present... Godmouth by P. L. Macmillan. The first time I heard it was from a dying woman's lips. She'd been hit by a car that had been going at least double the speed limit. The driver hadn't stopped. Instead, the car had squealed around a corner and disappeared as the woman slammed into the ground with a sickening crunch. I saw it happen, as did four other strangers. I ran to the woman's side as she lay dying. I knew she had to be. I was a nurse, and the amount of blood surrounding the woman on the pavement was gruesome. I heard a man on his cell phone talking to the 911 dispatch. The other stranger stood a little ways away, watching as I checked her vitals and tried to make her comfortable. Her eyes were a beautiful shade of the palest green, reflecting the stormy sky above. She wasn't upset or crying. I thought that she must be in shock. Uh, miss, an ambulance is coming, the man on the cell phone said, raising his voice to avoid coming closer. I nodded. Did you hear that? Just hold on, you'll be okay. I lied, pressing my scarf against the deep gash on her scalp. Half of her forehead had been scraped up, and into her hairline from her collision with the pavement. Her skull glistened. Her lips moved, but I couldn't hear any sound coming from them. Her eyes never left the sky. In the distance, I heard the insistent wail of an ambulance. I leaned in, turning my head so my ear was closest to her mouth. I heard the faint whisper of her breath. She was trying to say something. The ambulance screamed through the streets. Is there anything I can do? Is she going to be all right? A woman asked, clutching her coat around her and staring at me with wide, frightened eyes. I shook my head and turned back to the dying woman. I started. She was staring right at me. Her manicured hand clutched at my sleeve and she smiled. I leaned in, meaning to comfort her. God, mouth, she said. She died then. Her fingers slipped from my sleeve to land in her blood, which was reflecting the sky as her eyes did once more. There was a contented smile on her lips. May she rest in peace, said another woman, shaking her head. Such a shame, said the woman, clutching her coat. Did anyone get that asshole's license plate, said the man. The ambulance roared around the corner and rolled to a stop nearby. I stood and stepped away from the dead woman as the EMTs jumped out of the back. The others and I stood and watched them try to resuscitate her. 
It wasn't long before they gave up and put the body on a stretcher and covered those blank eyes with a blanket. The women crept close, their eyes latched onto the still figure underneath the cover. The EMTs called in the death. A police car finally rolled up. What did she say to you? asked one of the women. Did she know that asshole in the car? asked the other. I shook my head. God, mouth, I said. God, repeated the first woman. She was praying, said the other. Satisfied, the women drifted off together to talk to the police. I thought about what they had said. It hadn't sounded like a prayer. By the time I had finished giving my statement and information to the police, it was growing late. I watched the police car and ambulance slowly pull away. All the strangers and watchers turned and wandered away as well. Only the blood pool on the pavement remained. I stared at the reflection of the clouds on the blood, at my stained scarf lying next to it, before turning my back against it all and walking back home. The next time, I didn't hear it. Rather, I saw it written on the side of a building in egg-yellow spray paint next to a crude representation of a wide-open mouth with square teeth inside. It was written all as one word. Godmouth. I caught sight of it as I was walking to the hospital. I stopped at the mouth of the alley and stared into the shadows. It had been written at chest height, above some dented trash cans. It was the first time I thought about that woman in two days. I took out my phone and stepped into the alley, trying to avoid the puddles of vomit and piss, garbage, and what looked suspiciously like human shit. I didn't know why, but I wanted a picture of the graffiti. After I snapped two pictures of it, I stood and stared at it, I felt a chill come over me as I remembered the dead woman's smile and the way her beautiful green eyes had reflected the clouds. How she had whispered that final word in such a calm and loving way. I was brought back to the present by the stench of a homeless man who had come up behind me. A spare doll for a homeless vet? <coughs> He coughed into his dirty hands before holding one out to me. I dug a couple dollars out of my coat pocket and handed them to him, escaping as his attention was turned to counting them out. I drew my new scarf tighter around my neck and hurried down the sidewalk, dodging the businessmen and women in fashionable clothes as they left work. I reached the hospital a few minutes late and my supervisor chewed me out as I got into my scrubs. I followed my boss out as she continued her rant. I can't have my nurses coming in late. You know how hectic and swamped we can be. I expect more from you. You're one of the best nurses I have. Ellen said as she charged down the crowded hallway. Things have been crazy here these last few weeks. You should know better. I'm sorry, Ellen. I won't let it happen again. No, you won't, she replied, shoving a clipboard at me. I looked over the counter of the nurse's station at the crowded waiting room. All the seats were taken, and even more people were leaning against the walls or slouching in groups near the entrance. No time to just stand around, Ellen said as she sat down in the chair behind the counter and began to sort through the forms there. I turned and went back down the hall to where the elevators were. The elevator dinged just as I pressed the up button. I stood aside as Jimmy, a night orderly, wheeled out an old man. The gentleman was withered, slouched over his lap with thick ropes of drool dangling from his mouth. He smelled distinctly of urine, and from the dark patch on his crotch it was obvious where the smell was coming from. Jimmy saw my expression and nodded. Yeah, I'll clean him up. It happened on the way down, and I need to get him to the MRI. He was fine an hour ago, talking about politics. <laughs> so bizarre. 
the old man began to rock back and forth. I saw a smile on his face. And then he said it. Godmouth. What did he say? Jimmy looked down at the smiling, drooling old man and shrugged. Oh, I don't know what it means. He just keeps saying it. Probably just a side effect of the stroke he had, or whatever it is that caused this. Jimmy lifted a hand in a wave as he pushed the wheelchair down the hall and away from me. Staring after them, I stepped onto the elevator and pressed the button for the fifth floor. Ellen was obviously pissed at me since she had given me the worst night duty to cover. The psych ward. Normally this was covered by the resident psych doctors, but with budget cuts it had been relegated to the nurses. On the bright side, they usually always assign two nurses to take care of the patients, since some of them could be violent. Allison was already behind the counter on the fifth floor, waiting for me to arrive so we could start the rounds. Allison was my favorite person to be teamed up with. She was forty, but acted like she was still in college, cracking dirty jokes and partying on her days off. Ellen hated her. Which is why Allison often worked the night shift on the fifth floor. She smirked when she caught sight of me. Guess who got lucky last night? She asked by way of a hello. I rolled my eyes, but couldn't help smiling. Let's see to our guests and you can tell me all about it, I replied. She filled me in on all the sticky details as we walked the bright halls to the backdrop of whimpering, screaming, and hissed one-sided conversations. I hated this floor so much. We rounded the final corner and she took the left side, I took the right. We peeked in the windows, checking to make sure everyone was in bed or at least accounted for. Most of these people weren't too unstable. Just some mild schizophrenia and paranoia. Occasionally they could get violent, but neither of us would be actually going in the rooms. I was checking the third room when I froze. The patient, Walter Carlson, was asleep with his back to me. Above his bed, scrawled in big blocky letters, was the word that had been haunting me. Godmouth. Worse, the words were wet-looking and red. I must have gasped because Allison was immediately at my side. Oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, is that blood? I think so, I said. Fuck me, is he dead? That's a lot of blood. Is he breathing? Can you tell if he's breathing? I squinted through the window but shook my head. We have to go in there, I said. I'm calling security. Allison darted down the hall to the nurse's station. I found my hand on the doorknob before I realized what I was doing. I listened to Allison arguing on the phone. I stepped inside the room, leaving the door open behind me so the hall light could shine further into the room. The words glared out through the shadows, gleaming in the faint light. Inside the room, I saw that the opposite wall had been marked as well. The crude mouth drawing, exactly the same as the one in the alley, had been dabbed onto the wall with more blood. This drawing was larger, though, and I could make out that the teeth were long and stretched down past the lower lip. They ended in a blunt line, not in points like I would have assumed. I'd completely forgotten the patient until I found a roughly made shiv at my throat. I froze. You see? You see? The patient muttered, his other hand rising to point at the painting. I could see his hand was coated with tacky blood. His wrist had been gashed open. He pulled me to the open door. I need to leave. I'm needed. I must spread the word. We stepped into the light and I saw Allison standing next to a security guard. Her mouth was agape as she stared at us. I wanted to say something, scream even, but I was frozen. My lips felt numb. 
I felt my knees begin to shake, and suddenly I knew I was going to faint, and that when I did, the knife would slice my throat as I fell against it. My chest seized up, caught in the tight bands of panic that threatened to take control. I clenched my fists and allowed my nails to bite into the skin, hoping the pain would clear my head. Allison was speaking, trying to calm the patient. I felt him shake his head behind me. I must leave. I must open the doors. Open them. I need to leave. I'm needed. Look and see. He pointed into his room. The security guard took a step forward. The patient screamed, grabbing my hair and pulling my head back and exposing my throat. No, 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 no! He screamed. I saw the hand with the blade rise, and I tried to bring my hands up to stop him, but they moved so slow, as though in a dream. The patient jerked against me, and his hand fell away from my hair as he slumped to the ground. I looked over my shoulder and saw another security guard with a gun raised. I hadn't even heard the shot. I stumbled away from him and leaned against the wall, trying to catch my breath. My ears rang. I watched Allison kneel next to the man and check for a pulse. She shook her head, and the security guard radioed the information back downstairs. Soon I was heading down myself. Ellen waited for me in her office. I sat down before her and took the tea she offered. It was Ellen's method. She wanted to be liked by everyone on the staff, but she couldn't help being the controlling bitch that she was. So she made me this tea to seem like she cared that I had almost had my throat cut by some psycho, but I could tell by the deep lines around her eyes that she was more angry than concerned. I'm glad you're all right, she lied. I nodded and waited for the axe to drop. I can understand that you were concerned for the patient, which made you enter that room without waiting for security. However, now a patient is dead. We have rules for a reason. I nodded again, staring into the steaming muck. Normally, I would put you on an unpaid suspension, but we're short-staffed, as is. I'll just have to give you a written warning and put this incident in your file. I hope you will learn from this. You've gotten sloppy, and I can't have patients dying because of your lack of due diligence. Ellen cleared her throat and stood. Of course, I am glad you are okay. You may go. By the time I'd returned to the fifth floor, Janet had cleaned the blood off the walls and floor. Allison was waiting in tense silence at the nurse's station. I was glad when the day broke and the shift ended. Listening to those people scream and cry and whisper all night made me feel like I'd be locked up next. Walking home... I saw more graffiti. It was everywhere, as if an army of madmen had swamped the city armed with spray paint. I saw shop owners scraping the words off their windows with fast, angry movements. A businessman throwing a fit over his vandalized Mercedes that now had a new mouth painted on the hood. I saw the words in chalk on the sidewalk, in paint on the walls, and written with marker on the sides of buses. I was glad to finally get home. My fiancé, Rob, had already left for work. I checked the fridge to see if he'd left me any notes, but found none. I showered. Even after scrubbing and scrubbing, I could still feel the patient's hand in my hair and his homemade knife at my throat. But I couldn't remember his name. I was too awake to even try falling asleep, so I turned on the TV, hoping the sound would make me feel safe again. I was in an endless black field. Or maybe it was an ocean. 
It churned and rose and fell. But it wasn't an ocean. And it wasn't a field. It was something awful. And I didn't want to see what it was. It was massive. And it went on forever. And it was all around me. I didn't want to see. I didn't want to, but I couldn't close my eyes to it. I felt it closing in all around me. And I opened my mouth to scream. I woke with a violent start and found the TV blaring fake applause as a contestant correctly guessed an answer. I pulled myself up into a sitting position and checked the time. It was just past six. A voicemail waited for me on my cell. It was Rob telling me he was going to be late. I shivered and looked out over the back of the couch. The apartment was dark and empty. I went to the kitchen, turning on all the lights as I went. I double-checked my work schedule on the fridge and was relieved to see that I was off for the next two days. A heavy feeling of sadness hung over me, whether from the incident with the patient or from that fast-fading dream I'd had. I couldn't tell. I didn't want to be alone. I tried calling Rob to see when he would be home, but only got his voicemail. I tried calling a few friends, and when none picked up, I felt this certain knowledge that everyone in the world must have disappeared while I slept. Disappeared into that vast darkness. I clutched at the counter, overwhelmed with that sudden wave of irrational panic. The sharp, shrill jangle of my phone caused me to scream with fright, even as I grabbed it in relief. It was Rob calling me back. Sorry, babe, I know I'm running late. The CIO, CEO, and a bunch of managers didn't come into work today, and no one can seem to get a hold of them. It's been chaos here. I'm just leaving now. Let's meet at the cookery tonight. My treat, huh? I wanted to ask him to come get me, that I was too shaken to walk to the restaurant three blocks away, but I held it in and just said, Yes. I got dressed and pulled on my jacket. Through the apartment walls, I could hear the TV of my neighbors. It felt like, with Rob's call, the world and all its cacophony had come back again. Wrapping my scarf around my neck, I left my apartment building and turned down the dim street. All around me, the words stood out in sickly yellow paint. Despite being a Friday night, the sidewalks weren't filled with people going to bars or restaurants or clubs as they usually were. The men and women I did see walked at a quick pace, almost a jog, clutching their purses or scarves tight as they rushed to get wherever they were going. Most kept their faces turned down to the ground beneath their feet. But others were like me, and stared at the words that marked almost every surface. I heard the crisp crinkle of paper under my feet and looked down. I trampled a pamphlet. As I stepped off it, I stopped, looking up at me in neat black ink. Was the mouth. Numb, I reached down and picked it up in a simple font. Godmouth was printed across the top in capital letters. Then underneath was a detailed drawing of the mouth. Now I could see that what I had thought were teeth were really thick segmented tentacles that draped down from the spherical mouth. I opened the pamphlet, hoping for an explanation, but found only nonsensical gibberish. Over and over the words were printed, sometimes in capitals, sometimes in lower case. Spread throughout were sentences like, Grant us peace, release us, cleanse, purify, erase, and 
we are all equal inside. I looked on the back for a printer's logo and found only blank paper. I let the pamphlet drop and wiped my hands on my pants. I continued on my way and saw that the sidewalk was littered with those pamphlets for blocks. I walked by an open alleyway and heard wailing laughter. I paused and looked in. Five young men and a woman stood in a circle around another woman who was kneeling in the refuse before them. It looked like they were carving something into her forehead with a small pocket knife. The woman looked up at me, said something to the others, and they all turned. I could see what they had carved into the woman's forehead clearly now, because they had already done it to themselves. It was a rough copy of the mouth, standing out crimson with their blood. The woman with the freshly gashed brand smiled as the blood ran down her face. The men leered and began to walk toward me. I turned and ran. Their laughter chased me. I didn't stop until I was inside the cookery. Rob was waiting at a table next to one of the front windows. I sat in one of the wicker chairs, the pristine tablecloth rustling against my legs. A tea candle in a pink glass holder flickered between us. Hey, sweetie. He reached over and clasped my hand in his. I looked down at my hand in his as I tried to catch my breath. Hey, you all right? He made as though to stand, but I waved him down again. In short, choppy sentences, I told him what had happened in the alley on the way here. His face went ashen. Jesus, I'm so sorry. I should have picked you up, especially with what's been going on lately. I looked at him, and he must have seen the confusion in my face. It's been all over the news. They think there's some new gang or something. It's so strange, though. I mean, normally gangs tend to stick to an age range or nationality, but the members of this gang range from all over. The waiter walked over and Rob ordered for the both of us. We only ever got the same thing each time we came here. The Kanachiwa hot dog with wasabi mayo, all beef sausage, bacon, tempura bits and mayo for Rob, and the Bishop Burger with bacon, cheese, panko-crusted fried shrimp, the secret sauce, lettuce and extra pickles for me. Both came with the house special sweet potato fries fried in duck fat. It was all sinfully delicious. I haven't heard anything about that, I said, picking at my napkin and tearing bits and pieces off of it. I'm not surprised you never pick up a newspaper and you sleep through the news, Rob laughed. Tell me about it then. I wanted to hear him say the word. I wanted to see if it was haunting him like it was me. I don't know. They just suddenly appeared, I guess. They don't seem to be involved in drugs or any illegal activity, really, besides the fact that they're vandalizing everything they can. One of them got my boss's car two days ago. He was pissed. <laughs> Rob laughed again. What? What, what? what were they writing? Rob shrugged and leaned back as the server brought over our beers, placing them on the table with two solid thunks. Oh, I don't know, in the name of their gang or something. Me and the guys think that they're some sort of cult, like Marilyn Manson's group or whatever. Charles Manson, I muttered. What? I shrugged. I was disappointed. How could he forget that word? Didn't it haunt him too? God mouth. A cult makes more sense, really. Especially what you said about those fucking kids cutting into their foreheads. I nodded and looked out onto the street. It was empty now. The twilight was growing thicker, darker. 
One by one street lights flashed on, flooding the street with weak yellow light. One illuminated a mouth drawn on the shop window of a boutique across the street. There's no one out tonight. What? Rob looked out absently, his eyes glazed over in thought. Oh, they're probably out on Deosori Street or something. I doubt it. I think all the sane ones are locked up safely in their homes, hoping to wait out whatever is on its way. We were both surprised at what I'd said. Rob looked at me long and hard with a worried glint in his eyes. I tried to smile, tried to make it seem more like a little joke. Then the server brought us our food, steaming on white porcelain plates and looking like heaven. It gave us an excuse. Not to talk. Sunday was bright and beautiful. It was usually the only day we both had off since I normally worked Saturdays. As a treat, Rob had ordered a gourmet picnic from some little shop on Dusori Street and we went to Warden Row Park for lunch. Even though the day was unseasonably warm and the birds sang in the branches above our heads, I felt ill at ease. Rob was as oblivious as ever. In fact, he was even happy. He was convinced that the missing managers meant he'd be getting a promotion soon. He'd hated the missing CIO, most of all, since he worked directly underneath him. For Rob, everything was looking up. But I'd seen the people hidden in the alleys, hunched over distinct pamphlets. I'd seen that word everywhere. It crowded out shop windows and blanketed walls, sidewalks, cars, the mouth gaped on stop signs and benches. The city was being swamped. Even the park was not untouched. I'd seen it on the beautiful fountain, the ugly word smeared on it like yellowed feces. Looking at it made me feel dizzy. I think I have a good chance at it, Rob was saying, smiling. Hey, look at the fountain. Do you... See that? I pointed. His brow furrowed. He turned and I watched the back of his head. I watched the wind caress his curls. I don't know, it's some graffiti. He turned back, shrugging. Yeah, but what does it say? I'm curious. I lied. He glanced over his shoulder for a moment and then picked through the basket to grab another croissant. Uh, who cares? Some shithead wrote something dumb. I stared past him. I could clearly read it. Godmouth. It screamed at me from across the grass. Don't you think, honey? Rob asked, and I nodded with a smile. The day seemed to darken. I looked up into the sky, squinting against the stark daylight. There were... No clouds, but still there seemed to be a looming darkness that hovered over the city. And yet the sun still shone as if it wasn't there. More cheese? I shook my head. Suddenly, I knew we were being watched. I jerked my head and stared back over my shoulder. A woman turned away and bent down to pick up her dog's crap. Beyond her, a man sat on a bench reading the newspaper. I turned my head back and looked beyond Rob. A couple walked by, holding hands. A mother pushed a stroller. Hey, hey! Rob snapped his fingers in front of my eyes. I looked at him. Jesus, where are you today? Sorry, I guess I thought I heard something. He studied me. I was relieved when his phone rang. I knew I would have to tell him about the word, about my experience with the dead woman and the crazed patient. I'd point out the graffiti, the gaping mouth, the pamphlets that littered the streets. But would he think I was crazy? Rob hung up and grinned. 
They want me in on Monday to talk about the position. I told you, I told you I was next up. I smiled along with him. We walked home together, holding hands, and I watched as he carefully stepped over the pamphlets without really realizing he was doing it. We walked past a dozen or so fresh graffiti marks. I didn't point them out. After we made love, I dreamed of that dark expanse that wanted to devour me. I looked all around me and heard others, but could not see them. I called out Rob's name, but did not hear him. It was closing in. Those dark, moist folds of darkness would wrap around me, and then what? I woke up as Rob pushed himself out of bed, turning off his obnoxious alarm. I felt fuzzy. Things seemed out of focus. I tried to go back to sleep as he showered, but couldn't. Wish me luck, babe. Rob tightened his tie and grinned. I did so and watched him leave. I spent the day on the couch watching TV. Normally I used my days to visit shops, cafes, wherever I wanted, but I saw that the streets were still empty this morning, as they had been over the weekend. I didn't want to go out there into the silence. I imagined how oppressing the silence would be, how unnerving the emptiness. I thought of the group of kids in the alley, carving simplistic, gaping mouths into their foreheads and shuddered. So I watched the news instead. Police Sergeant Roger Morris finally gave a statement regarding this new gang that some citizens have dubbed the Mouthers. The pretty, petite newscaster chirped. The camera cut to an overweight, graying man in uniform, leaning with a weary heaviness against a desk littered with crushed styrofoam cups, coffee rings and scattered papers. A crowd of reporters crowded him, microphones jabbing at his face. All I have to say is that the situation is being handled. This is not a serious issue. What about the recent triple homicide? Weren't the victims brutalized with the image of the mouth carved into their chests? A reporter shouted over the others. Can you comment on the recent massive amount of disappearances in the city? Another reporter pushed forward. The sergeant wiped his face and slumped further down against the desk. All I can say at this time is that the disappearances have not been exclusively linked to any one event or group. What about the murders? Isn't it true the homicide rate is on the rise? I have no other comment at this time except to advise the citizens of this city to stay indoors after dark, keep their windows and doors locked, and to avoid any situation that might place them in danger. The sergeant turned and waved away the bustling reporters that tried to search after him. The camera cut back to the perky blonde. While the authorities won't confirm that the disappearances that have been on the rise are related to the recent cultish gang activity, I think it's safe to say that there must be some connection. Now on to Jake with the weather. I switched it then and let a talk show host scream about the wonders of the new diet pill she had discovered while I waited to go to work. Rob messaged me once, confirming that he had gotten the promotion. I had to wonder if it was any sort of an accomplishment to get promoted just because your boss had disappeared, probably running around naked with a mouth cut into his forehead, I thought to myself, and shuddered. I didn't relish the idea of walking to work in the empty streets as the sky dimmed, but there were also no taxis in sight. I clutched my pepper spray in one hand and avoided all alley entrances, refusing to even look at them. I arrived twenty minutes early, having practically run the last block after someone somewhere started shrieking. Ellen sat behind the desk, her face buried in her hands. The waiting room was as empty and as quiet as the streets. Ellen? 
The older woman jumped and looked up with eyes surrounded by the smear of old mascara. Oh, it's you. Why did you bother coming in? There's no one here. Her lip began to tremble, and I was shocked to see the glisten of fresh tears in her eyes. Ellen was like iron. I'd never seen her scream or yell or cry. Ellen, I reached out and touched her hand. Maybe she saw this as permission to be weak because she grabbed my hand and pressed her damp face against it, crying. I let her go on for a bit before pulling away. I circled around the desk and put my arm around her. What happened, Ellen? Where is everyone? She hiccuped and rallied, trying to put on the same mask she wore every day for her staff. Dead? she said and shrugged. Or insane. This whole city seems to be going to shit. Her lip trembled again and she bit it, drawing blood. My Kevin. He went over. He lost it. Her whole body began to shake and I pressed her tightly against me, trying to quell it. He brought home one of those ugly pamphlets. He kept saying how this was the solution everyone needed, but didn't know they needed it. Then he just left. He didn't even pack his bags. He was just gone. He left his cell phone, his wallet, all his money, and... and... She stuck out a hand and opened it. A man's wedding ring glinted in the overhead fluorescent light. We both looked at it. The silence was heavy. Where are the other nurses, Ellen? Where are the patients? Gone, I told you. Dead or worse. Yesterday when the sky went dark in the afternoon. Everything went crazy. I thought about my picnic and the sun that struggled to shine through a dark mass that wasn't there and yet, all the same, hovered over the entire city like a brief storm. Beth was killed, Ellen mumbled. She tried to stop all the psych patients from leaving. You know how she is, always sticking her nose in and meddling. The patient from room 204, Sandy Mitchell. She stabbed Beth in the eye with a pin. I don't even know where she got it from. I was afraid to ask. And Alison? Ellen shook her head. Alison never showed. She didn't answer her phone either. She's missed two shifts. Let's go, Ellen. You should go home. I can't. The woman broke down again. It's so empty there. And I keep thinking he's going to come back. But he doesn't. And I'm so afraid. So I left her there, in the empty hospital. The sun had fully set by then, and some people were out. It was still so quiet. I pulled my pepper spray out of my purse again and made my way down the sidewalk. Several people had dried blood on their faces and clotted messes on their foreheads, where I assumed they'd carved mouths. Their eyes were raised to the sky. They smiled as if waiting for a great surprise. Others were like me, scared and twitchy. Rob was on the couch, beer in hand and watching TV when I stepped in. Oh, I thought you were at work he said by way of greeting. No one was there, except Ellen. All the patients and staff were gone. I felt numb, 
like I was walking through a dream and trying to figure out how to wake up. Yeah, we had a skeleton crew going on today too. It was exhausting having to deal with everything. The city is going insane. He looked over at me, his eyes lit up by the light of the TV screen. Why do you say that? Are you blind? Don't you see the people walking around with mouths carved into their foreheads? Haven't you seen the pamphlets? The graffiti? It's... It's... I struggled to say it, but couldn't. I tumbled helplessly to the couch beside him. Jesus, hon. You're starting to sound a little crazy yourself. You can't not see it. It's everywhere. He just looked at me, concern and even a little fear on his face. We sat side by side on the couch, an old western playing while he nursed a beer and I tried to figure out if I was in fact going a little crazy. Beyond the tinny sounds of the movie, I felt the overwhelming and horrible silence of the city. It lay in wait for the pauses between words to creep forward like a living thing. Later, after we'd brushed our teeth and Rob lay beside me snoring, I listened for the silence between his breaths. I forced my clenched jaw to relax for the fifth time and forced my fists to open. I looked over and gazed out through the window. All the windows of the neighboring building were dark. The air felt heavy, pressing down in on me. I thought of the dead woman who spoke the word into my life the very first time. She had stared up into the sky with a smile on her face. I passed the time until I fell asleep in my memories. It felt safest there. Then I dreamed of nothing but darkness. In the morning I felt calm. I stood on our apartment balcony and leaned over the railing. Below. I saw that the street was full with people. It almost looked like a regular work day, except that most of the people weren't rushing to get to work. Most of the people were standing on the sidewalk or in the street, looking up to the cloudless sky. Most people were waiting. Rob came up behind me, frowning as he stared down at his phone. I noticed a glaring yellow mouth had been painted across the side of the apartment building across the street. I wondered if I just hadn't noticed it yesterday, or if someone had managed to do it just last night, in the darkness. I got an email from work. They sent out a company-wide mass email. They told us not to bother coming in today. Makes sense. He looked at me. I saw the fear in his eyes. He thought I was losing it, but I wasn't. I shrugged and took his hand. I pulled him close against me and looked up. He looked up. It began. It started slow. The sky began to darken for no reason. If you weren't expecting, you never would have noticed. Not at first, anyway. Then a great void yawned open, made up of coils of inky darkness, much like smoke. It stretched and stretched until it hung over the whole city. I heard the people on the street below gasp. The darkness became more solid, became
became more real. In the void, I saw the great convulsing folds take form. The darkness roiled with fearsome life. Then four massive, thick tentacles emerged. They were segmented like a worm and were of a dusky, dark, purplish color that reminded me of a deep and old bruise. At the tips, the tentacles ended in a multitude of smaller, more flexible appendages that reached and twisted. The massive tentacles moved with a delicate and slow determination. I watched them stretch past buildings until I lost sight of the tips. I felt the impact, though. Everyone did. Rob screamed and clutched at me, gripping the balcony railing with his other hand. It's an earthquake! he cried. He tried to pull me into the apartment, but I shrugged him off. I finally realized. Rob couldn't see it. He thought it was an earthquake because he couldn't see the god mouth. He was blind. He pulled at my arm once before I jerked it away from him. I turned my back on him and stared up at the darkness. Car alarms blared. People screamed in the streets. I heard the apartment's front door slam shut. I looked down and watched as Rob ran into the street, pushing those who stood still and calm, staring up. The tentacles strained. Their thick flesh bulged with the effort. Then, Godmouth began to move. It began to pull itself down. The sun was gone. A false twilight fell upon the city. I felt that I should be afraid, but was not. Below, the streets surged with those who were blind to the vast entity that bore down on our city. The drivers drove with desperate frenzy, crashing into those who stood waiting, and those others who also tried in vain to escape. The great lips widened, stretched around to encompass the entire city. There was no escape. I turned and walked out of my apartment, but I did not descend the stairs as Rob had. Instead, I went to the roof. The roof door was unlocked, as always. I saw a few others from the building, leaning against the railing, not talking or crying, just watching. I joined them. It was nice to be with people who understood. Together we watched Godmouth draw itself ever nearer. I felt the draw of the terrible emptiness between the black folds in the mouth. There was a place for me there. There was a place for all of us there, and we would all be made equal. The man standing next to me took my hand. I did not look at him, but I was grateful. My hand was cold. His was cold. The great lips connected with the earth. The city was now trapped beneath the dome that was Godmouth. No escape. All one could do now 
was wait. But that was all right. I was all right. In the end, it came quickly. A horrible heaviness came first, a crushing weight pressing down with intent. Then the unnatural silence of a whole city frozen in anticipation. Those massive, creeping, undulating folds came down upon us. They opened up. And at that moment, looking up at what awaited me, my numbness finally broke. And I screamed. Godmouth by P. L. Macmillan. If you'd like to ingest more of this author's work, you'll find information and links in the featured authors section of our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au. You know, we haven't had an edition of Nocturnal Transmissions Recommends this year yet, have we, gentle listener? Let's meet our new acolytes, then see if there's something worthy of discussion in our proverbial kit bag, as it were. Our latest Patreon-subscribed acolytes are Dana Lewis. Hello, Dana. Daniel Douglas Hoare. Hello to you, Daniel. Daniel Domino. Another Daniel. Hello, Dan. Welcome. And Corey Chimko. Hello, Corey. Thank you, one and all, for choosing to support our humble production. Your largesse will not go unrewarded. Now, are there any out there amongst our listenership who enjoy the writings of Stephen King? Put down your devices. That was a rhetorical question. I already know the answer. And that's why he will be the subject of this episode's iteration of Nocturnal Transmissions Recommend. Stephen King. Is there a name that looms larger over the realm of horror wordsmanship? I think not. His books have sold more than 350 million copies worldwide and have been adapted into numerous successful and, admittedly not so successful, films and television series. Titles such as It, Carrie, Cujo, Misery, Pet Cemetery, Salem's Lot, The Shining, and on and on are not merely successful horror novels. They are works which leave an indelible stamp on what modern horror is and what it will become. Now, knowing what an avid consumer of dark audio content you are, gentle listener, we are going to share with you a delightful means by which you can engage with Mr. King's masterful horror writing in a medium you are sure to enjoy. The unabridged audible audiobook presentation Skeleton Crew by Stephen King. A bumper collection of chilling tales featuring performances from numerous talented narrators, including such luminaries as Paul Giamatti and John C. Riley, no less. 
A particular treat is hearing Stephen King himself read his renowned short horror classic, The Raft. Oh, it's a goodie. Now, this isn't an advertisement, gentle listener. This is a recommendation. We have been listening to this captivating collection of King Creepiness while walking our number one minion, Ponyo the Carpathian Hellhound, through the menacing woods surrounding our eldritch abode. And I can say that it has been most diverting. So, King Lovers, the unabridged audible audiobook presentation, Skeleton Crew by Stephen King. You'll find it on Amazon. Nocturnal Transmissions recommends it. And so ends this, our 96th episode of Nocturnal Transmissions. Number 100 is fast approaching. What do you think we should feature on that auspicious occasion? We have some ideas, but nothing is set in stone just yet. If you have a suggestion, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. And you'll most certainly be given a little thank you on the show if we choose to embrace your advice. Oh, speaking of little thank yous, this episode was brought to you with the generous assistance of our Patreon subscribers. A particular thank you goes out to our esteemed cohorts. Chris McCauley, Alex Brewis, Robert Troy Hampton Peterson, Evan Dooley, Sam Bell, Michael Wood, Alicia Townsend, Shell, Stephanie Saloka, JB, Rachel Brown, and Z. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. All voices and production are concocted by... Kristen Holland. Until next time, as always, watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone, especially yourself. Good night. Gentle. Listen.